The True Problem of Evil Part 1 The True Story of Evil We all feel there is something wrong with the world. Throughout ages, we've been struggling with suffering. The solutions were varied, despair and resignation, fighting and war, love and care. We tried to analyze the problem, get to the root of it. We conceived of the source of all the suffering, hardship and adversities, the essence of all these problems. Evil. There is evil in the world. There is evil among us. There is evil within us. Evil is the problem. Alongside all this pondering, we've been immersed in the world of beliefs in our gods. Especially the God of Abraham had influenced the way we think about suffering and evil. That's why we frequently looked for evil within us. We are fallible and we are wrong was the theme. But this didn't silence all the questions. A new problem soon emerged. Why does our beloved God allow for all the bad that falls even on the most innocent of us? Some of us suffer terribly, much, much more than others. They didn't deserve it, we scream. We've since stopped asking why doesn't the all-good God help them? Thus, we've been stuck with the problem of evil. Increasingly, we've started looking at the world not through the lens of our old religions. We pay little attention to religious dogma. We understand the origins of humans and other forms of life. We have a better sense of our place in the universe. We don't need God anymore. But the problem of evil has remained. Just different, because now we no longer have any powerful being who we could blame for everything that ails us. No one has set up this world the way it is. No one is responsible for all the miserable people perishing from the face of the earth each day, right? Right? Are we sure about that? God is no longer with us. We took the place of God. We make the law, we judge, we command. Back then, we thought it was God who created the world. Now, we can merely know how the world is like. We no longer think of metaphysical evil. We're left with meaningless, senseless, but very visceral suffering. There is no spiritual dimension to it no cosmic scale, our misery is mundane, uninteresting, with no exaltation or gratification for the struggle. What doesn't kill us leaves us scarred, crippled and broken. There is no growth through suffering, only trauma and degradation. The significant switch in perspective is this. In the past, we believed it was God who created us humans. Now, we know how our species evolved. That's not the same as creation. We haven't been created by God, so we haven't been created by anyone, right? Wrong. No single someone created humanity, but every single one of us had been created by our parents. Granted, that's much less of an accomplishment. But we do have our creators. Our procreators have brought us into existence. And in turn, we procreate others into this world. We have now identified where we, on the individual level, come from. This point is trivial. It is so trivial that it barely registers in our consciousness. It is so obvious and so normal that we don't even stop to think what are the consequences of this tried truth. But in the age of no God, we can slumber no more. Back in the olden days, we could wonder why God allows for all the suffering. Why hasn't he delivered us from evil? Or even whether God created the world so bad that we can barely move without falling into one of his traps. Today, we have no supernatural scapegoat. But without the all-knowing, all-loving, all-powerful, can there be any responsibility or blame for the way the world is? Surely, if we haven't created the world as it is, 
we couldn't be held responsible for the evils we see, right? Not necessarily. Let us examine these traits one by one. A god could have known everything that has happened, is happening and will happen. We are utterly limited in what we know. We are limited in what we can know. But we cannot turn a blind eye to what we do know and what we can know. We know that every single one of us goes through hardships, gets ill, gets harmed and hurts others, gets old and frail, and eventually dies. This is what we know about every single one of us. This is what we know about every single one who we bring into existence. What we do not know is whether the one we bring into existence will be joyful or miserable. This we cannot know. We attributed to God an infinity of benevolence and love. God is love, the saying went. What about us? We're not that, that's for sure. We are imperfect, biased, weak, fallible. We can do good, but we also do bad. We know this about ourselves and about others. Those who we bring into existence will also be like that, striving to do good, yet failing and doing bad. The God of our grandfathers could do everything we could imagine and more. He created the world. He created us. We can barely make a difference in the world. We've been striving to make the world a better place since way before the recorded history. As individuals, we can just barely influence people around us. We cannot control the world our children will live in. We cannot control how the future will look like. What this means is that we cannot make the world a safe and welcoming place for our children. Whatever happens to them is not something we can prevent, stop, plea with. We throw them into the world and then they're pretty much on their own. We can't protect them. The differences are striking. Yet, we know a thing or two about those who will come after us. And we know we cannot know answers to very important questions. We're not all good. Our children will not be all good. We can't protect our children because we cannot control the world. And this has serious implications. In the past, we could accuse God of allowing evil. Today, the situation is even worse. The limitations of our being means we're not merely permitting evil into the world. It is us who create the very possibility of evil in the first place. We bring future victims into the world. We procreate future oppressors. With full knowledge of the dangers of the world and of the certain suffering and death, we push our beloved children into the uncertain, uncontrollable, dangerous, unforgiving and deadly place. We put our darlings into a cage with snakes, poison and thugs. A cage no one has ever came out of alive. They can't make it. The question is not whether they will succeed or fail. The only unknown is how will they perish. We don't allow evil to take place. We bring evil into the world. We cannot plead ignorance. We know full well how the world is. We cannot say we did all we could. There is no redemption. There is no one to absolve us. There's only us. It's all on us. Part 2. In plain English. In simple terms, all we're doing is we're taking the problem of evil in theology and applying it to the secular context. We arrive at an analogy between the theistic worldview and the secular worldview. And each has a corresponding problem. Let's break it down. In the theistic worldview, God created the world. In the secular worldview, we can at most know how the world is. God created humanity as a whole. We just procreate. We bring other people into existence. God knows everything, including 
everything good and bad that will happen. We are very limited, but we do know some of the things that will happen in the future and we can know what may happen. God can do everything we can imagine and more. We as individuals can do very little. We cannot control the world. God is all good and all loving. We are a mixed bag. We help each other, but we also hurt each other. In the theistic worldview, there is evil and sin. And the problem is, how can an all-powerful and all-loving God allow for his creations to be exposed to so much evil? In the secular worldview, there is suffering. And the problem is, how can we bring our children, whom we love so much, into existence knowing how much suffering there is in the world and that various bad things will happen to them. God merely permits evil to take place. We create the victims of abuse and we create the perpetrators. Interestingly, in both cases, the problem of suffering in nature applies. God permits senseless suffering, but we also do nothing to help animals living in the wild. Theists came up with various answers to the problem of evil. We won't go through them here. These are mere answers and not solutions that can be put into practice to make evil go away. In the secular view, after we've identified the problem, it's clear that it is we who perpetuate much suffering in the world. And because we do this, we can immediately ask ourselves, what can we do about it? Do atheists and agnostics have an answer? For some, the answer seems pretty obvious. Since we're creating those who will suffer, the solution would be not to bring others into existence, not to perpetuate the problem that needs fixing. If not this, then what answer, what solution to the secular problem of suffering can an atheist give? 